who have joined us from US and other parts of the world. Uh, I am Monalisa Hasra and uh, Regional Energy Manager and uh, Clean Energy Specialist at, uh, in the Energy Team at uh, USAID India. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you, uh, the speakers, as well as the part participants for today's Knowledge Dissemination se seminar, seminar organized as a part of the GTG uh, series. Uh, today's event is being hosted as a part of a USAID's bilateral program with the Ministry of Power called Greening the Grid. Uh, Greening the Grid is a, a, a bilateral program which focuses uh, on supporting uh, GOI's efforts on large-scale integration of renewable energy in, in support of its uh, target of 175 gigawatt of renewable energy. As a part of this program, uh, uh, we, uh, the central piece of it, which is called as Renewable Integration in Sustainable Energy or GTG Rise in short, USA is implementing six grid integration pilot. Uh, to test and validate technologies and solutions that could support RE integration. One of the pilots that is being implemented under GTG RISE is, uh, you know, is testing of AGC or automatic generation control in hydropower as well as solar power plants. As a part of the program, we also, you know, frequently host such knowledge dissemination webinar series to share lessons and experiences from the pilot and as well as you know, to present international experiences and things which are happening all across the world on these on these uh, technologies and themes. So today's webinar is is one such effort to present to you the international experiences on automatic generation control and dynamic reactive power control for large scale solar power plants. Today we have international experts from National Renewable Energy Lab or NREL who are also GTG or Greening the Grid partners to bring forth some of the international examples and share their experiences. In addition, the webinar will also present uh, the, uh, some of the framework or some of the highlights from the AGC pilot that is being implemented under USAID's GTG RISE initiative, um, uh, which is the specifically the AGC pilot, which we are implementing in partnership with POSOCO and NTPC, um, at NP Kunta. Um, I would also like to quickly mention that GTG RISE is implemented by Deloitte Consulting um, as a part of, uh, you know, on behalf of USAID. Um, I sincerely hope that the webinar will stimulate discussions and create awareness amongst the relevant stakeholder, especially system operator and solar developments in the country on this very important topic. So before we you know, start, I would like to quickly, you know, set up some ground um, housekeeping announcements, make some housekeeping announcements and, um, uh, you know, the usual stuff, but, uh, you know, still important. Uh, first of all, you know, we have all, we will be recording this webinar and the recording has already started. Um, I, I will request all the speakers to switch off the camera and mute themselves when they are not speaking. So it's such that, you know, we are able to ensure that there is no disturbance for the speakers who are speaking at the time. I would also request the speakers to adhere to their allocated time. Um, you know, I I would hate to interrupt you and uh, you know ask you to hurry up. So that that's a sincere request. Um, uh, another request is for the audience: please do put your comments and question in appropriate places. So uh, please put your questions in the question and answers box so that we don't miss it. And if you have any comments, please feel free to put it in the chat box. But if you start putting your questions. In the chat box, there's a chance that we may we may miss it. Uh, further, we will, as as we do with all our webinars, we will be circulating the webinar recordings and the presentation, as well as the link for useful resources which are related to the pilot, as well as the topic which is being presented today, uh, within a couple of weeks after after uh, the webinar is completed. Um, so I'll quickly check if Mr. Porwal is here. And since he's not here, what we are planning to do is to quickly begin with our first presentation, which is by Satish and uh, Chandra. Um, and I'll invite uh, Satish to make a presentation and set the context for the uh, for the uh, for the event today, for the webinar today. Uh, so Satish is the director with Power and Utilities Consulting in Deloitte, India. He has over 14 years of consulting experiences and he specializes in large scale RE integration, battery storage, EV deployment, distribution and transmission network and so on. Uh, so I'll quickly request, uh, you know, Satish, 
to take it over from you. Please, you have to unmute. So, um, thanks, Monali. Um, Ripu, if you can project on the screen, we have a, a couple of slides only, not too much. So, please go ahead. So, this is the initiative and the pilot which Monali talked about. Go ahead on the rise, please. So, so um, um, we um, we are working with USAID. We are uh, kind of supporting them in implementing. Uh, the key initiatives which are required for large scale RE integration in Indian grid. So, as we are aware, that 2022 target was somewhere around 175 gigawatt, and then 2030 target is uh, close to uh, say 450 gigawatt. So, uh, with this uh, large amount of renewable penetration uh, in the Indian grid, uh, there would have been implications in managing the real time um, variances in demand and supply. So we started the journey somewhere in 2017, where we had uh, stakeholder consultations from various agencies, and then we devised uh, six key pilots. To name a few, uh, we are working on uh, battery energy storage systems uh, along with PG power grids. We are also working on flexible power generation uh, with NTPC and Gujarat uh, State Electricity, you know, Electricity Generating Company. And also this AGC pilot, which is there, that is the topic of discussion today. And we are also devising a platform for a um, regional uh, platform for uh, reserve sharing. <clears throat> and also battery storage and distribution. So dynamic reactive power compensation and also uh, this uh, uh, automatic generation control is the key agenda that is charged out today, where we will be de deliberating uh, much more in detail. So Ripu, if you can please go ahead. Yes. So um, in Indian context, if we talk uh, uh, very, uh, you know, in terms of absolute minors, uh, there had been provisions for 5% spinning reserve and, and uh, for supporting the primary reserve. So primary reserve, secondary reserve, tertiary reserve, they, they are actually defined in terms of time scale. So when we uh, say primary reserve, that is somewhere from zero to 15 seconds, and then secondary reserve is uh, a fraction of um, kind of two, three minutes, and then the tertiary reserve is a fraction of hours, say for example, 30 minutes or so. So the primary reserve provisioning was already there in the power sector and was mandated by uh, uh, electricity policy like uh, NEP, National Electricity Policy, and also IEGC. And tertiary uh, reserve uh, was also mandated uh, somewhere uh, uh, in last six to seven years back through a kind of RRAS mechanism, that is Reserve Regulation Ancillary Service Mechanism. However, what, what uh, the Indian power sector was missing was secondary reserve resources. So that has gained a very uh, much more priority uh, once this large scale RE deployment uh, took um, a kind of accelerated pace. So um, um, in terms of those initiatives uh, where we are talking about secondary regulation reserve implementation, so. AGC Thermal was one of the kind of uh, pioneer uh, pilot, which was <coughs> initiated by POSOCO uh, in collaboration with NTPC and, and Dadri plant in uh, Northern region was uh, enabled with those provisioning. And now uh, based on the pilot outcomes, uh, NTPC along with POSOCO support, they are implementing uh, across uh, thermal fleets in the nation, uh, similar kind of AGC enablement. The other two key tasks were AGC Hydro and AGC Solar. So AGC Hydro again, this uh, this is something which uh, GTG Rise, uh, funded by USAID, was um, um, asked to work on these aspects. So uh, we have already demonstrated a kind of um, um, enablement of AGC Hydro in Saravati plant in Karnataka, Karnataka Power uh, Corporation Limited, and also uh, we are now working on AGC Solar pilot. Uh, which we plan to conclude somewhere around uh, 30th April by this year itself, and, and then come out with key uh, outcomes, uh, which are uh, no, something like uh, regulatory mechanisms, commercial settlements, and other kind of aspects. So, so once we talk of AGC solar pilot, this is very important aspect because the thermal AGC as <clears throat> secondary AGC is fine, the uh, AGC hydro is also fine. They can provide. Uh, very kind of uh, support to the grid in terms of managing ramping support requirement and also balancing the real time active and reactive power uh, mismatch uh, uh, say you can mismatches 
However, when we talk of AGC solar, uh, because in Indian context, AGC is a kind of must run kind of uh, scenarios. When we talk of any RE generation, solar or wind, we assume that this should not be curtailed off. However, uh, in terms of the broader picture, when we say that we must have a provision to safeguard our overall grid from any kind of uh, outages or say major disturbances, we must also harness these kind of potentials which are already inbuilt there through the inverters which are installed at the solar cells. So, as we understand, there are inverters which have a, a provisioning to modulate real and reactive power. So, in this pilot, we are not only modulating the real out, uh, um, the real P megawatt output, but we are also modulating the reactive power support so that we can uh, compare how this kind of reactive power support could be a very a plus plus point for uh, any utility uh, 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 large scale grid operators uh, in terms of uh, replacing it by statcom deployment and as per the cm uh, guidelines and regulations issued in uh, somewhere around 2018 i think in february so uh, that uh, uh, clearly mentioned that any uh, power plant uh, the re power plant having a capacity of uh, more than 10 megawatt and connected at 33 kv uh, level they need to have a provisioning for uh, modulating the real and reactive power and also they need to install uh, power quality meters so in this uh, particular piece, which is uh, again supported by uh, USAID and GTG is we are actually uh, trying to demonstrate that the provisionings and the CA regulations uh, issued in 2018s are when in, when in place and, 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 and the scope under this pilot uh, spans from uh, modulating the real power output from a solar plant and then modulating the reactive power output and also measuring uh, uh, power quality measurements at the solar power plant output and also at the inverter outputs. So I'll, I'll just pause here. I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Um, Atla, who will um, give a brief on the technical architecture and then here. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can skip this, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Satish. Yeah. Uh, so I will take you uh, to the, the pilot where we are implementing uh, uh, the solar power plant, which is uh, actually at N, uh, NP Kunta, it is in uh, Andhra Pradesh, so which is NTPC's 250 megawatt solar plant. So if we take it on the left hand side, this is the electrical uh, circuit design, uh, where we have uh, 250 megawatt plant, each uh, block is 50 megawatt, and which is connected to the uh, 33 kV evacuation, and then 33 kV evacuation line to the up to 220 kV uh, substation. Uh, which is around uh, 18 MVA per transformer, like that we have four transformers. After that, overhead transmission lines. And then we have the uh, central uh, substation, that is the power grid uh, substation, the 400 kV by 220 kV. So if you uh, just uh, look back to the uh, right-hand side, so this is where the uh, pilot is working on. So the uh, at the end, you can see the inverters. So we have the ABB inverters at two blocks and the Hitachi inverters at three blocks. So the control comes, uh, as Satish has mentioned, whether the reactive power or active power comes from the inverters. Now the point is how you make these inverters response as per the uh, grid operators. So as uh, most of people knows about, this plant basically controls by the, uh, uh, what do you call it as a CTU, Central Transmission uh, Utility. So basically regional uh, control centers, okay? So the signals will go uh, to the SRLDC at force. So for this pilot perspective, so we wanted to showcase as a case and how it will be done. That's why we are taking to the from the NLDC through SRLDC. And finally, the signals will be available at 400 kV substation. So once the signals comes from the NLDC, like uh, I need a control from the generation, say maybe uh, my solar generation has to reduce 5 megawatt low or uh, 3 megawatt high. So that's just going to go back. So here the 400 kV, there will be a, a power plant controller that is basically an aggregation power plant controller will communicate with the NLDC and gives back to the controls to the uh, uh, 50 megawatt uh, uh, blocks. So from the 50 megawatt blocks, this kind of software which is available will uh, respond as per that and uh, gives the signals to the ABB node. So this complete uh, two-way communication and the hardware required additional hardware 
uh, will be enabled as part of this pilot and we are going to see about uh, how uh, the inverters response uh, for the uh, system operator signal and also we are doing a local reactive power dynamically how the uh, inverters helps to maintain the grid voltage within the limits can you go to the next slide please so as part of that uh, uh, agc this is uh, i'm not going to explain about how the agc works but this is how uh, agc at nldc already giving the signals to the thermal inverts and also the hydro units just they started recently uh, and along with that this solar plant also will be modeled as one virtual plant where the signals will be configured and given to the particular solar plant. Once it comes into picture here, and uh, this power plant controller will work on the two principles that will be tested as a use cases. One is you can see here, I have a lot of inverters will be there in each block, maybe 50 or uh, 40, depend upon the size. So some of the inverters will be selected as a reference inverters. And so that I can make sure that how much control is available from the controllable inverters. So uh, uh, that is where the reference inverters and control inverters will be distributed and make the uh, control. Other way also, the forecasted uh, solar generation also will be used uh, to say about whether you need regulation up or regulation down. So this is the where uh, we are going to test it the uh, hardware, software, and uh, functionality of the inverters, how much inverters can support. Technically speaking, uh, uh, speaking, this uh, inverter has the full of control. It can go, uh, of course, if the cut element allows, uh, based on the grid conditions and what are the benefits uh, this uh, participating into the AGC. So because that's where uh, the compensation mechanism, uh, which uh, we are going to come out from the pilot, will help the uh, solar developers. So what benefit they will get it if they uh, participate in. So it should be uh, more than what their uh, regular time. So how much is the point? So there the uh, some regulations will come out on that framework uh, guidelines. And uh, so that's how this uh, uh, pilot is going to address both technical and as well as the uh, uh, regulation aspects. So this is what I just wanted to share about what we are doing at uh, present with the help of Enra, all those things will generate a different use cases. Yeah, with that, uh, I thank you for the, giving the opportunity. So I will uh, uh, request uh, Monali to take it forward. Thank you so much, Chandra, for taking us through the uh, uh, the details of the pilot, which we are implementing as a part of your CDG Rise program. Uh, also, since I didn't introduce Chandra, yeah. uh, I thought that I'll introduce after Satish is done. But Chandra is, is, uh, has been associated with PRDC for the last 12 years. Um, he's pretty well known in the energy sector has published 25 publications and in various international national conference and journals. He also has a vast area of experience and I'm not going to go through them, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, Chandra is a key, one of the key uh, experts working with us on the GTG RISE initiative implementing this uh, pilot. Uh, so thanks Chandra for taking us Thank through. You. Um, we also have now, I think uh, Mr. Rajiv Porva, uh, um, online we had some technical difficulties getting him um, to join us but um, uh, can we uh, can you please put on your mic and uh, camera mr porva um, and maybe we i can also request at the same time all the people on the camera that we can quickly uh, contact moment i had hoped that we will do it before the program started we were waiting for you to join us uh, mr porva so can i request uh, Vahan and uh, uh, David uh, and Mohit are three experts from Enver and uh, the team from RISE, uh, Pratik, uh, um, Sushar, uh, and uh, Opi, and I see. Please switch on your cameras and I can we can quickly take the code at moment. And I apologize for taking a wee bit of time this, uh, doing this. Uh. Mahan, we still don't have you on the camera. Vahan, Kakuli, okay, Kakuli, we see Tushar, Vahan, Vahan, Prati, Bupi. Yes, we can see you, Vahan, and uh, I'm just waiting, Bupi. Yes, Bupi, can yeah. you please do the honors and tell us that yes, it's done, and please, please smile for the cameras and opportunities to the, all the participants. Done? Great, thank you so much. And uh, what we will do now is uh, go back to the original schedule. Is basically have Mr. Popa um, his opening remarks, talk about a little bit about the um, 
about this particular pilot, we are going to uh, most of it. And once we have done that, then we will come to our uh, speaker for today. Uh, so over to you, Mr. Porra, for your opening. Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, very good evening. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks to uh, USA GTG Rise uh, for organizing this very important uh, workshop uh, or say talk on this subject because this is going to the future and uh, as India is integrating a lot of renewables, it is definitely going to be a big, big challenge and uh, this uh, AGC pilot on uh, renewable stations is going to be definitely very helpful. and. Uh, as more and more uh, generation, thermal generation reduces, our convincing generation reduces because of uh, large uh, integration of renewables, say 175 gigawatt by uh, 2022 and then uh, 450 gigawatt by 2030. Definitely it is going to be a uh, big challenge uh, balancing the uh, energy requirement and then variability, uh, controlling the variability of these generations. And therefore, this uh, um, AGC is uh, going to be very, very handy, uh, a very important tool. Before I go into this, uh, you must be uh, aware that Indian grids, earlier uh, regional grids synchronized, and we got a lot of help in uh, stabilizing the frequency through integrating, uh, uh, making India as a one grid. Uh, entire country now operating in synchronously one grid. So not only a uh, lot of... Um, uh, you can say reserves from each of the region uh, pooled also the uh, different type uh, also it help in the frequency stabilizing because of diversity we could uh, utilize and because the inertia also increased uh, a lot of uh, generation which came online in our entire country so inertia also increased so we also this also helped in frequency control uh, then uh, we also in very used very innovatively the uh, deviation settlement mechanism to control the a lot of fluctuations in the uh, frequency and uh, it stabilized to a larger extent but still to go forward uh, we need to have uh, secondary control also and that was thought that uh, in 2015 uh, CRC came out with the idea of uh, that no reserves has to be maintained and then uh, we also pursued that and uh, by that order, they said that no, uh, AGC is also going to be implemented. And in 2017 order, they uh, said that pilot has to be done. So by 2000, uh, January 2018, first pilot on AGC in the country was done on the Dadri uh, thermal uh, units. And later on in 2018 and 2019, we uh, wired five uh, pilots in all the regions, definitely again uh, thermal power stations in all of the regions, all NTPC stations basically. Uh, so this was the, uh, this was a very good experience and uh, we were uh, having approximately 5000 gigawatt on uh, bar. Uh, this though uh, only 50 megawatt variation was allowed during uh, pilot phase and uh, but it has a uh, limited impact on an entire of uh, say 180 gigawatt uh, uh, grid size but it gave a lot of insights how to wire and what need to be taken care of and a lot of uh, learnings uh, we got from this and then later on in uh, say 2019 CRC gave another order in which uh, they said uh, okay uh, wire all the ISGS stations so now presently we are wiring uh, 90 uh, around 94 um, generating stations with around 85 gigawatt uh, we are wiring to the control centers and this will be a very very uh, big uh, job and most of the stations are now uh, coming up and uh, we are testing each and every stations getting uh, connected to the uh, first open loop testing then closed loop testing so approximately 30 gigawatt uh, we have uh, till now we have wired successfully tested uh, uh, with the, uh, that signal is going to the uh, power plant and uh, we are receiving the data from power plant and we are able to do the accounting also that uh, okay
Uh, Mr. Porvar, you're on mute. Sir, you went on mute, yeah. I see okay, you. Okay. Mute. Today itself, we have tested one of the gas uh, turbines on AGC. We have uh, Anta unit today itself, we have uh, done a closed loop testing. So it is a great experience, and we look forward to the this uh, uh, RE generator coming in AGC fold and uh, because. Again, uh, with the 2019 regulation by the uh, CA, which talks about that uh, uh, reactive power as well as reactive power of the renewable generators need to be uh, can be controlled, and they have to provide this facility uh, so that it can be controlled from single from say any uh, dispatch center. So that is why, if uh, this type of facility and what are the uh, issues coming up in such facilities. So it will not only give a lot of experience to the system operator, but also to the plant operator. And it is will be a win-win situation. It is the future. And so uh, again, I will um, thanks GTG uh, and USA that they have uh, given such an opportunity. At a fortunate time, this talk has been organized. This uh, workshop has been organized that uh, People will be able to understand, and not only the power plant operator, but the system operators, uh, how future system operators is going to take help from this uh, is uh, will be definitely deliberated. We will be learning a lot of new things from uh, NERL uh, representative, uh, the expert from NERL, and their experience in uh, renewable generators. Um, controlling the renewable generators from control center uh, or automatic generation control. So that is, uh, we till now we have only the experience of thermal generators, but slowly, slowly we are coming to hydro generators as well as uh, gas generators, but this will be definitely a new experience. And I look forward to listening to the uh, expert from um, NERL and also from the uh, other expert. And definitely we are looking forward to actual pilots which when, when the data starts flowing to control center and we start giving signal to the uh, power plant and control that power plant as per the requirement of grid. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Rajiv Ji, for taking us through the, the Indian context and specifically laying out what has been done and what, what we are looking forward to. Uh, so we are also equally quite excited about the whole pilot. Uh, so just for the benefit of all the participants, Mr. Polwal is the Chief General Manager at POSOCO, and he's also the Reliability Coordinator for the Northern Region and has a whole lot of experience in terms of operational planning, real-time grid operation, operation services, management, information system, and so on and so forth. So thank you so much for taking time, uh, Rajiv Ji, and joining us today and just setting up, you know, um, giving opening remarks. We'll now uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Vahan. Uh, Jawad Jian. I'm so sorry, Vahan, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Vahan is uh, Dr. Vahan is a chief engineer for grid integration at Enrel in Colorado. Uh, he joined Enrel in 1994, and since then has been involved in many research projects related to grid integration and energy storage. He currently leads several research projects funded by U.S. Department of Energy and uh, has led a number of collaborative pro projects with U.S. and international in in energy industry members. Um, so Vahan uh, would be presenting, making a presentation on the international experiences uh, of uh, automatic generation control. And so I'm passing on to you, Vahan. So over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, am I being heard and seen, right? Yes. Uh, yes. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Thank you, Monali, for the uh, introduction. I'd like to thank uh, uh, USAID in the office for inviting us to be part of this webinar. Also, like to thank Deloitte for uh, their collaboration with NRL on this uh, AGC pilot projects uh, that are going on in India. So, uh, in this uh, talk, I'd like to share some experience of a similar pilot projects we performed in, a, in, the, in the different places in, a, in the United States and also discuss uh, some other aspects uh, related to the integration of high shares of a variable uh, renewable generation into a grid. But first couple of slides, I'd like to focus. I've been asked to give uh, some 
some brief insight on the uh, uh, latest uh, blackout event that happened in, in Texas in air code power system, which triggered a lot of interest and a and, and, and lot of questions globally. So uh, I'll, just, I'll just give you a brief information about that, uh, that particular event. So uh, this happened uh, uh, actually on a, a uh, early morning of February 15, and what led to this blackout is 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 a combination a combination of events. So number one was the uh, unusual uh, cold front uh, moving on and covering the whole region or whole footprint of of aircraft operations, um, by far exceeding the typical winter peak and in fact uh, exceeding also their uh, expectations on extreme winter peaks, which was 67 gigawatt level, but the actual load that they've seen that night was around at around 69 gigawatts. So uh, this was basically uh, the adequacy issue. Um, and uh, and to, to, to clarify, because a lot of people are asking this question, this wasn't like an instantaneous trip off of many generation units that caused this. This was a, a partial and gradual shutdown of the units because of the various reasons. Uh, and that also led to the uh, number of orders to shut down the loads in, uh, uh, in air code territory, which basically ended up in uh, about 20 gigawatts or more than 20 gigawatts of unserved loads, uh, as you can see on this graph. Uh, the things that make it even more complicated is that the aircraft system in, in U.S. Is, a, uh, uh, is isolated from two major U.S. interconnections, uh, Eastern and Western interconnection. It has cut just a few very weak uh, DC links uh, uh, connecting them to the rest of the system, but uh, you know there is no uh, any means for aircraft to import uh, additional uh, capacities from from the neighboring interconnections, uh, and that actually contributed uh, into this problem. Into this problem, uh, here is a more detailed um, uh, insight of that. Uh, zoomed in view of that particular event um, so you can you can see the how the uh, uh, the load was increasing in, uh, uh, in in Texas after February 9 as cold front was moving in which is interesting just before that they had close to 60 percent wind penetration in Texas territory so they had record high demand uh, on, on, on a Valentine's Day night so I don't know what's going on perhaps people in Texas were celebrating too hard uh, but they actually survived that peak. The problem started later in the morning of the next day on, on February 15, when a uh, number of gas units started to, uh, uh, to shut, start, uh, started to drop off. And this was, again, the combination of reason, uh, the freezing of compressor stations for a gas supply, problems with, with instrumentation and so forth. So within a course of a couple of hours, they lost close to 15 to 20 gigawatts of generation and then continued losing the generation. And that also resulted in shutting down a large amount of loads in the state. So you can see that for a certain period of time, the aircraft was operating with very low or almost no reserves. Uh, this is a lower chart showing their reserve capacity in gigawatts. And then, uh, and then the frequency also recorded uh, this is not an instantaneous frequency, of course, this is 10 or 15 second average, but you can see that they had very low frequency for a certain period of time at 59.3 hertz, which is basically a level of first level of the threshold of their under frequency load shedding. Um, the, uh, this is actually even more zoomed in view of the event in terms of a grid frequency. So you can see as the units were uh, being shut off one at the time, uh, the air code control center was requesting more and more load to be shed uh, just to keep a system alive. And they went pretty close to 59.3 hertz. And then uh, they tried to uh, uh, bring the frequency back to 60 hertz by actually ordering more and more um, uh, uh, load being switched off. And this uh, Blackout state actually lasted for about two days in Texas. Um, now the system is normal. Uh, this is a uh, snapshot of a system operation. The last point on um, on the right is taken actually at midnight last night. So this is very up to date. Um, so as we're moving far away from the uh, from the blackout, you can see the system is operating in full fully normal state. 
wind and solar generation are operating and um, they, uh, they hit uh, more than 50% of penetration by combined wind and solar many times during that time. So uh, some preliminary investigation shows that the wind and solar generation didn't contribute into this problem at all. Uh, the, from solar generation standpoint, it, it happened in the middle of the night, so you can't blame solar for that. For wind generation, you can see that even before the event, uh, wind production in Erkut was very low. There wasn't much wind uh, resource going on. And during that extreme freeze, also some turbines were shut down because of the icing on their blades. Um, but uh, the, the actual wind production in Erkut was very close to the forecast. So again, the uh, wind and solar really has nothing to do, they have nothing to do with this event. Uh, and uh, this was really uh, the combination of things that, that brought to this and uh, uh, the, uh, th th that close to a shutdown of the thermal plants, the gas power plants, the coal power plants, and also one nuclear unit was also shut down uh, uh, because of this issue. So, and I'll be glad to answer more questions about this later if you guys have that either, either at the Q&A session or, uh, or I'll, be, I'll be happy to answer them through the email. So now we'd like to focus on the uh, topic of this presentation, which is the overview of uh, the pilot projects and the uh, uh, grid integration challenges happening in the United States and other places in the world. So uh, this is a summary of uh, future grid operations uh, that we think need to be managed in, in a different way uh, to, uh, to manage a more complex grid uh, which will happen if we have very high shares of variable renewable generation in the form of wind, wind and solar. So uh, the expectations are that there will be a, a increased requirements for up and down regulation, and we're actually seeing it in many places in the U.S., especially in the, in the island, uh, island grids where the uh, instantaneous renewable penetrations uh, are going extremely high. Uh, that also brings a need to manage uh, increased inter-hour flexibility and uh, uh, longer uh, daily ramps, especially in the morning and evening when a, when a PV generation is going up and down. Uh, they manage to, uh, they need to manage the oversupply during the midday. So if you don't manage it in the correct way, you'll end up in a significant levels of curtailment. And that's a situation we see in California in, uh, during the many days of a year. Uh, the, this also creates opportunities for uh, controllable renewable resources to provide essential reliability services because as conventional generation is being uh, decommitted, uh, someone needs to take their place and provide these services to the grid. And that also raises expectations from ISOs and balancing authorities to leverage capability of these new resources to provide this type of services. Uh, and uh, as variability in the grid is increasing, then uh, also, the, uh, you need to put uh, more efforts in place to be able to comply with uh, frequency response application and, and frequency response standards uh, that are imposed by uh, uh, different regu regulatory docu documents in the, in the U.S. set by, by NERV, in particular the, uh, the Bell, uh, Bell, uh, Bell family of standards. And also the impact of distributed energy resources on a bulk grid system at very high levels of penetration is, is not fully understood. So more studies needs to be done uh, to understand that impact and, uh, uh, and make sure that uh, all possible issues are addressed in a, in a planning and the design stage. Uh, North American Reliability, Electric Reliability Corporation, NERG, is the main uh, regulatory body that sets the standards for this type of operations. And they already recommended that uh, variable renewable generation should provide essential, should be able to provide essential reliability services to the grid in the, in the form, uh, different forms of active power control and also the reactive power control. Uh, and also the, uh, uh, they should have ability to uh, provide reliable performance during and after the uh, transient events and grid, dis grid disturbances. So ramp rate remitting controls, um, the, uh, the active power controls in the form of inertial response, primary frequency response, secondary response or AGC, and also ability to follow the uh, security constraint economic dispatch set points uh, in real-time energy markets that are the, the, the most important capabilities that have been highlighted by NERV. 
and also the ability to provide voltage and the active power and the power factor control uh, both a dynamic uh, in a both in a dynamic and a steady state mode uh, is also uh, extremely important. Um, there are new reliability challenges that are emerging uh, as level of penetration goes goes high, uh, and, and they are related uh, to the fact that the grid strength is inevitably going to go uh, down because of the uh, uh, levels of inverter-based resources that are coming online. Uh, Inverter-based resources can do many things, but one thing they can do is provide overcurrent, and that inherently brings to the reduced grid strength, which in turn will bring stability issues uh, 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 and also the uh, uh, degraded transient performance over grid, and may also have impact on a protection because in a lack, if there is a lack of short circuit current, our traditional protection schemes won't work. Uh, this also brings to degrading synchronizing torque and reduced inertia. Uh, as a level of inverter-based resources going high, the question arises, who is going to provide the grid for me? Uh, this is a role traditionally reserved for uh, conventional generation, uh, but inverter-based resources are fully capable of providing this service. But how to do it in the most optimized way is still a subject of research, and I'll, and I'll talk about it uh, in, in a couple of slides. Uh, new reliability challenges in the form of control interactions, uh, wide area stability issues, subsynchronous os oscillations and resonances will also rise. When you have many inverters trying to do the same thing, especially under weak, weak grid conditions, they inherently will be impacting each other. And that's also a very important issue to consider, very important reliability challenge to consider. Uh, I mentioned the increasing need, 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 need in flexibility and also the resiliency services. Uh, uh, so the grid forming capability is inherently tied up with the block start capability. So um, how it's going to happen, uh, you know, in a situations like Texas, when you don't have many conventional units and how you're going to block start the grid and bring it back to normal operation by just using the inverted base resources. So those are all new reliability challenges that we also need to keep in mind as uh, 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 we are integrating more and more uh, variable generation resources uh, into the grid. So um, the high levels of solar generation um, has its own specific set of impacts and uh, California ISO is one uh, place where these are already manifesting that's themselves um, in a form of so-called uh, dark chart. So you see an example here. The high level of sol solar generation during the midday hours are already contributing to oversupply, especially on light load days in California when uh, uh, solar production is high and the load is low. This is one example from uh, May 2019. Uh, you can see that a lot of solar generation needed to be curtailed. Uh, it's a red, red portion of a chart because of oversupply, oversupply issue. Um, uh, the sharp changes in the real time ramping needs are also happening during afternoon to evening hours, as you can see here on this chart. This is especially evident again during the spring or fall months when the loads are relatively light and hourly penetration of renewable generation is going extremely high. So, uh, this type of issues can be addressed by uh, operating the PV fleet in a more flexible way and also by using the uh, energy storage in a, in a, in a, in a march in, in a mar uh, much higher uh, levels than it is done now of course um, so this type of curtailment uh, events also create opportunity for pv generation to participate in the frequency regulation market because this is a huge amount a huge amount of a spinning reserve that is totally underused uh, ironically california i saw uh, you know, has to dispatch uh, other units to provide the frequency regulation where this large amount of spinning reserve is just sitting there. Even a small portion of this cartel PV could have provided or, or filled in all frequency regulation needs for a California ISO. And the reason this is not happening is not technical, but uh, it, it's essentially, uh, you know, the regulatory issue and, uh, and uh, I will we'll cover that again in, in, in a few slides. Uh, the frequency regulation market itself is not a huge market. On the chart on the right, you can see um, the uh, size of the average daily cost 
uh, for frequency regulation in the California ISO for both day head regulation up and down and also real time regulation up and down. So it creates up the revenue opportunities for, uh, in particular for PV plant owners. But again, compared to energy market, this is a very small market. So you can see that uh, daily average uh, during the spring months is roughly around 400 to $500,000 a day. It's much lower during the, uh, uh, the other months. And uh, the real time regulation costs are share of, uh, uh, of a market is very small compared to they had they had market. So for PV to participate in this market, that brings number of issues. So number one, PV generation needs to provide the service in a very reliable and deterministic way, which is not easy to do if you have a highly variable resource. And also in a, in a, for a day head regulation up and down market, uh, you need to have very good forecast uh, uh, of, your, of your PV resource. That also brings uh, additional complications for that. So uh, this is kind of a reasons why the PV is not participating in this market on top of regulatory issues. But we've done a number of demonstrations showing how this type of limitations can be overcome by smart controls and by use of the uh, advanced uh, 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 forecasting techniques. Um, there are a number of tests have been conducted by NRL using our own um, uh, uh, generation assets. There's an example of the uh, 500 kilowatt PV plant located at NRL uh, following the set point signals. And the reason I'm showing, showing this, this, this result is to demonstrate how fast the PV plant can follow the set points uh, coming from a sit, uh, system operator. In this particular test, we actually simulated the whole chain of um, uh, uh, signal coming from uh, um, the from a, from a control room all the way to the plant controller. Um, and we uh, actually had all the hardware in places, including the remote terminal units, um, uh, RTAG units, um, real-time automation controllers, uh, all the network communication in place. We emulated the uh, uh, delays in a fiber network. And we also, uh, uh, this, these results were generated uh, with the real uh, internal RAM limits in, in the PV inverters. So from here, you can see that uh, uh, the Cartel PV plant can follow the active and deactive power set points very accurately. And what is remarkable here is that both active and deactive power set points are changing at the same time. So this is a simultaneous test demonstrating that the PV plants can provide active and deactive power completely independent on each other as long as we are within the current limits of a plant, and they can do it very fast. Uh, here we recorded about 400 millisecond delays that are mainly related to internal ramp rates, uh, ramp rates inside of inverters, and we work with inverter vendor vendors actually now to cut this down to less than 100 milliseconds uh, if necessary. So uh, this basically shows that PV generation can do it very fast and in a very high precision way. Uh, Number of demonstration projects have been conducted in the U.S. for the last five years or so. Uh, we've done demonstration projects similar to what you guys are trying to do in India, in uh, in Puerto Rico, which is a island network uh, in in the United States territory. Uh, we also conducted the tests uh, in 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 a, in a west in a West Texas area, where lots of PV uh, development is happening now. And with these plants, we actually demonstrated how the uh, different forms of active and reactive power controls can provide services on a plant level. And we also demonstrated some more advanced controls, such as inertial response provided by PV plant and also fast frequency responses uh, provided, provided by PV plants. Uh, after that, we conducted a really large test and demonstration in California utilizing 300 megawatt PV plant. This is the aerial photo of a plant. The tests were conducted about, I, I think, three years ago or so in participation with California ISO on first solar, uh, uh, several days of testing on this plant. And, and uh, uh, we took advantage uh, of the fact that we're allowed to do this testing during the commissioning stage of a plant. So we could afford very high levels of containment to demonstrate the services without paying a penny. Uh, and so we kind of pig piggybacked into this commissioning thing. So uh, that might be also the way for uh, when you do this type of demonstration in India, if you can 
to get into agreement with the plant owners and, and the system operator. Uh, a lot of demonstration can be done during the commissioning stage before the plant goes in und, uh, under the PPA operation. So this way you can take advantage of this, of this free opportunity. So uh, this traces here show the number of tests have been conducted during one particular day. A lot of active power control tests in the morning and a lot of reactive power control tests in the evening. And you can see when we change the reactive power, it actually impacts the voltage on a 230 kilovolt pipeline, the, uh, the yellow trace here. So you have to be very careful when doing the reactive power control test because you may introduce voltage disturbances that may impact the neighbors and cause the other equipment trip off that, that of course, will be a problem. So this should be very, very carefully planned test. And, and that's what uh, uh, we, we've tried to do in California. So uh, we didn't cause any issues uh, by, by doing this. Uh, this is a care very carefully orchestrated process. Uh, so number of test cases have been demonstrated. This is the example of the flexibility services that can be provided by the PV plant. This is a uh, controlled curtailment uh, and, then, uh, and then the restoration, production restoration by this PV plant going about 10% of capacity per minute. Um, so you see we, can, we went almost from full production down to zero and then restored it uh, in, in, in a very controlled way. This is an example of the AGC test, the PV plant following the AGC commands from California ISO. Uh, the first 300 megawatt plant was curtailed by about 10% of the capacity. Um, so you can see that uh, the plant then is following very well. The AGC set point coming from a, a system operator, uh, uh, the, the red trace and the, and the yellow trace is a uh, recorded uh, performance of a plant. Here I can play a video, hopefully this can be seen. Um, well uh, of that um, uh, of a test in, in a real time um, so you can see the uh, the plant following this command in a, in, a, in, a, in a very very accurate way the very high correlation between uh, set point and actual measured signal and here you you can see also some accumulated error, error statistics uh, which is really low uh, in terms of a percentage of a capacity of a plant Okay, I hope everyone was able to see this uh, this live live video going on. If you have a curtailed PV, so uh, automatic generation control participation can be one service, but as it was mentioned before, the primary frequency response also becomes possible. So we did this demonstration as well. Uh, this is an example of a PV plant providing the primary frequency response uh, 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 by emulating the uh, the real frequency event that happened in a Western interconnection uh, and feeding that frequency signal into a plant controller. So the white trace is the actual frequency event recorded in, in Western interconnection. And the yellow is a plant event uh, recorded at the 5% group. And at the bottom, you can see how linear, how linear the, uh, the frequency group characteristic of this 300 megawatt PV plant is. This is essentially a textbook uh, type of frequency response and uh, there is no conventional generation actually who can who can who can perform the uh, 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 in an event like this in such a linear way. It's only inverter-based resources, PV. We have also demonstration for wind and energy storage that, that can do it. So this is a tremendous advantage of inverter-based resources to become a uh, to provide this type of services because, as I said, they can do it in a very high high precision way, essentially without delays. Which you can see uh, from a linear shape shape uh, shape of this curve. Um, what we discovered from the uh, all type of active power controls test is that it's extremely important to be able to predict the uh, uh, amount of available head headroom in a curtailed uh, PV power plants. Uh, the same is true also for wind power plants. Um, so that uh, that limit is called actually. HSL or high uh, sustained limit. Uh, that's kind of a technical term used in a uh, US energy industry. So in order to uh, estimate that in, in under highly variable conditions for a PV plant is not a really easy task. It's easy to do uh, when under clear sky conditions, but when a resource is varying and the clouds are moving across the footprint of a plant, doing it in a very accurate way is, is difficult. And that's very important because to be able to participate in any type of uh, services 
uh, uh, or ser uh, service markets that are related to the reserves or active power reserves, you need to have very high uh, level of certainty in determining that reserve. Uh, reserve serv uh, service markets like certainty and uh, you need to have uh, special controls in a PV and wind plants to be able uh, to estimate that reserve in a, with a, in, in, a, in a very high precision way. So it is actually a research problem. We discovered that uh, uh, existing controls in the PV plants are not adequate for that. And that might be a barrier for a widespread uh, introduction of a variable generation into a frequency regulation and the reserve provision markets. Um, the, um, and that's also important from financial point of view. With an example of uh, metrics um, uh, and penalties that uh, different system operators in a use in the US uh, impose on the resources that uh, 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 the provide reserve services. So uh, if you are not able to provide the awarded service, in other words, uh, you know you overestimate or underestimate your reserve, then uh, you'll be penalized. Uh, if you continue doing it, there are rules for disqualifying the resource to provide that service. So that may be a very important issue uh, because uh, uh, frequency regulation and reserve markets are highly competitive markets. In order to be, become a player in it, you have to be able to provide it, uh, you know, with, uh, with, within a tolerance, tolerance bands uh, uh, that, that that, that, that may be different from each uh, system operator, but, uh, but you need to respect them by all means. Uh, so the concept is explained here. If you have uh, PV plant that is curtailed, uh, if you are underestimating your available resource, then uh, you are essentially uh, ending, ended up in an excessive curtailment. So uh, there is a financial loss associated with it to be able to provide the same level of service. If you are overestimating it, then you are providing insufficient reserve. So in reality, you want to this first case, third case when uh, you are constantly tracking uh, on a second by second basis uh, your available power. So every service that is related to a reserve, uh, active power reserve, whether is it following the dispatch operating targets, inertia response, fast frequency response, primary frequency response, AGC, or even more advanced services such as power system oscillations damping, all of them will, would, would heavily depend on the ability of a plant controller to determine accurately uh, the amount of headroom. So, um, oh, sorry. As I said, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a research problem and uh, we're conducting a number of research projects on developing the uh, algorithms for determining this reserve estimation uh, in a very high fidelity way. Uh, one uh, uh, real world experiment we conducted was a, with about a 50 megawatt PV plant uh, near the uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, this is a physical layout of the uh, PV inverters in a plant and, and, and the sections of a PV plant. Here we used the advanced technique of utilizing the uh, maximum point power tracking algorithms in the inverters themselves to act as a uh, uh, built-in mechanisms for reserve estimation. Um, we use technique of so-called reference inverters where you curtail only a certain number of inverters in a plant to provide a reserve and use the other portion of the inverters uh, 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 acting as a, essentially sensors for rest of them. Uh, and, and you can see that for the different numbers of reference inverters, we are, we are able to achieve very high level of accuracies predicting the amount of available power under highly variable conditions. So for example, with the plant has 96 inverters when you are using 48 uh, reference inverters, you basically cannot see a difference between predicted power and, uh, and, and the estimated power. And the reason it's really hard to do with an existing methods is because you have, in order to do it accurately, you have to have very accurate model of the inverters and the PV modules themselves. Um, you need to perform complicated calculations. You need to have lots of ambient measurements happening at the same time. And there are other factors you can't count. For example, dust or soil on the panels themselves. In some parts in the world, there may be uh, patches of snow and ice on the PV, PV panels. So estimating that is really hard utilizing conventional methods, but the methods that we propose here at NRL 
is gaining lots of popularity in the US and a couple of other places in the world. And people started using this for uh, headroom estimation in the PV plants. So as I said, it's really easy to do when a PV plant is operating under clear, clear sky conditions. This is one example of that. The each number of inverters on a vertical axis and hour of a day on a horizontal axis. So you can see that this is a pretty clear day. All inverters are operating more or less in the same way. So you can predict that in a, a available power, even using one reference inverter in, in an accurate way. Things are getting more complicated when variability kicks in. So a lot of things are happening in a plant uh, among different inverters during the day. Some inverters actually may triple or be uh, uh, underperforming and so well. So we demonstrated even on this 300 megawatt plant that this reference inverter technique works very well for the uh, uh, available reserve estimation. Uh, I'll probably skip the, this video because we have no time, uh, because of lack of time. So one example of the uh, commercial uh, uh, application uh, happened actually in Chile uh, by the end of, of last year. Uh, this is an aerial photo of the uh, 141 megawatt Luz del Norte PV plant in Atacama Desert in Chile. So this is the first PV plant in the world that was allowed to enter the organized ancillary service market, which exists in Chile for renewable generation. So this plant had to go through a number of certification and commissioning tests uh, and, uh, until the uh, system, Chilean system operator uh, certified them as, as a provider of ancillary services. And this plant actually implemented that technique I, uh, I described in my earlier slides. Uh, so they are now providing both primary frequency response and participate in AGC market with a very high level of precision. And to the best of our knowledge, this plant haven't been penalized any single time for not being able to provide the uh, awarded service. And they have been doing this already for several months, I think starting starting October, October last year. So this is very exciting news and also the uh, uh, real world example for uh, uh, rest of the power system operators globally that how this can be done. Um, we, uh, we, we did um, join the webinar with uh, First Solar and Chilean grid operator last week. So uh, I hope uh, some of you have been able to attend and, 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 uh, and learn more about um, this system. And there was also a live demonstration done. Um, so now at NRL, uh, we're taking it at uh, even higher, at uh, next step further, and we are developing a technique for a regional real-time estimation of PV reserve, trying to take advantage also of a geographic diversity of a resource and uh, reducing the uncertainty of the active power reserve to a bare minimum by utilizing the technique when you can do uh, estimation of this type of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the estimation of the available PV reserve in a, in a cartel PV plant on a regional scale. We are working with California ISO on first solar and we'll be utilizing the data from these large multi hundred megawatt PV plants existing in California and also forecast historic forecast data that California ISO has to develop a technique that is based both on measurements using this referenced inverter techniques in each plant and also machine learning algorithms to train the models to uh, predict the available reserves with a very high level of precision, cutting it down to a small fraction of a percent in terms of operational capacity of a PV in a, in a whole footprint of a California ISO. Uh, this method can be later implemented in, in other places in the US and, and world, of course. So um, uh, I have a few minutes left. I'd like to also touch base on the benefits of a hybridization uh over pv generation uh that can be done in a different forms of course uh co-located pv and wind power plants co-located pv storage plants and also co-located pv wind and storage plants um the pv uh and energy storage uh, hybridization is also is already happening in the us it also it is also happening in a, in a, in, a, in a many places in the world uh the cost of battery energy storage is declining rapidly which uh, makes it uh, this type of hybridization economically feasible uh, and uh, combining PV and storage uh, makes it possible to provide many services uh, that is not possible to provide with the PV only 
especially uh, uh, flexibility service and the services for curtailment reduction. You can also the uh, change and help customize the shape of TV production by utilizing the capability of energy storage. Um, and also you can provide all type of reliability services, even during the times when a PV is either uh, not available or uh, during the nighttime or, or significantly curtailed. But um, these are example of a real time experiments we conducted at NRL, where we uh, demonstrated different type of a PV generation shaping utilizing energy storage. Um, so you can see that uh, we're controlling the PV and we're also using certain uh, forecast data to, to generate these profiles uh, to limit the both mor morning and evening ramps, uh, which will have significant impact on a uh, uh, flexibility reserves uh, in a places like California. So, for example, uh, we are also providing pretty flat production uh, during the daytime uh, by essentially eliminating any type of curtailment. Uh, and, and you can see that we demonstrated different type of profile shaping, uh, depending on the forecast available and the resource variability. So it is totally possible. Um, you can achieve different type of shapes by uh, essentially uh, uh, having the energy storage uh, uh, by uh, using different 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 size of a power ratings of the inverter and different sizes of energy capacity of the battery systems. Uh, uh, just for records, this was done with a 500 kilowatt PV generation and one megawatt, one hour uh, uh, battery energy storage, uh, which is located uh, in our test site. Um, we've done also a number of demonstrations showing how, what type of resiliency services can be provided by the PV storage systems. This was also done, done in combination with wind. Uh, this was dictated actually with a real life event. We had a substation incident uh, that fits the power to our side. So the site went black into a blackout mode uh, in the late last year. So uh, this gas gave us a perfect opportunity to demonstrate how the PV generation combined with energy storage and wind can operate uh, the isolated system uh, uh, without any assistance from a grid. These are the example of many hours, in fact, 24 hours operation of our site, when a PV storage and wind were the only sources providing the power to the site. So the people who work at the site, they didn't even know where the, their power was coming from. It was operating in a very reliable way. Uh, the blue is the load in the bottom, so you can see that it was met all the time with the wind and solar generation and grid forming battery system. The battery system was the uh, uh, technology here that was forming the grid. Uh, we uh, implemented very advanced control uh, algorithms in here where battery was not only controlling the frequency and voltage, but it was also changing the frequency to shape the power output of wind and solar and generation from a group, uh, preventing uh, itself being overcharged or undercharged. So very advanced communicationless technique using just the grid frequency as a communication means uh, to, to keep a system in a stable operation. So you can see that we were able to maintain in automated way state of charge of a battery within the boundaries. And again, this was done by smart control of a frequency um, uh, during the whole period of operation. This is another example of that where we're able to maintain the system in a stable operation when a frequency, uh, I'm sorry, the, the load variability was very high too. Uh, you can see the very extreme uh, step changes in the load uh, uh, changes in the load because of the heating systems coming on. And again, this is a live demonstration of how the hybrid systems can provide high level of reliability and resiliency services to a grid. Um, with this, um, I'd like to conclude my presentation and open the floor for questions and answers and discussions. Um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm handing this over to you guys to take it over from here. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, really interesting presentation. I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, we already see a number of questions there, uh, although we don't have much time, but I'll still take a few of them and direct it to you. Um, so it would be great if you could respond. So one of the question is, um, which has been posed by Mr. Narsiman from Pusupo, um, is the maximum power point tracking generation level also telemetered to the system operator? Yes. 
Yes, it is part of a normal ABC scheme. So uh, ABC uh, time, uh, uh, time, time steps in a US power systems are no, normally four seconds, every four seconds. In islanded systems like Puerto Rico or Hawaii, it's actually more like faster, like two seconds. So the way it works uh, at the end of the ongoing AGC interval, the available power is being communicated to a system operator. So when it dispatches to the next set point to a participating resource, it is done by knowing um, uh, what available headroom is there. We ran this problem into this problem when we did a test in Puerto Rico. The example is shown here. The blue was the estimated power. So the system operator was calculating the power set point based on that. But since the estimation wasn't correct because of many reasons, uh, the algorithm wasn't correct and so forth, you can see that system operators was requesting more, the gray line that the plant was able to deliver. And that was causing certain issues, not very significant in this case, but nevertheless, that's an issue. So this is why we think that this uh, accurate estimation is very important uh, to enable uh, participation by variable generation into this market. Uh, because uh, for conventional fleet, they can predict or, 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 or they know exactly how much headroom they have with a very high level of certainty because it's not a variable resource. I hope this answers the question. Thank you so much, uh, Vahan. Uh, so there's another question which is directed to you. Um, it's mainly, um, you know, comparison of AGC between different forms of generation. So it says, what is the communication delay in AGC of solar system as compared to AGC of thermal and hydro system? Um, the, this 400 millisecond delay that I showed, um, as I said, it's, it, it's mainly related to the uh, internal ramp limits of the, of the PV inverter, which is a programmable feature, so it can be set very high. So this 400 millisecond delay is not necessarily uh, uh, caused by the communication delays and so forth. Keep in mind that we calculate this 400 millisecond delay. It's a time between uh, the signal was received uh, 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 or a signal was sent by the system operator, which we emulated, and the actual measurement uh, on a PMU unit when a system, uh, the actual power got to that point. So it's not just a communication delay, but it's actual, you know, the response of appliance, the response of the inverters, and, and all type of things. So um, the AGC participation in a conventional fleet uh, can be much slower than this. Um, uh, we actually done that sensitivity analysis when we did a demonstration on a 300 megawatt PV plant. So California ISO took the statistics that we generated from a, from a test of a PV and compared it with the re typical response times of their hydro units, gas generation, coal units, and even some storage units. And it showed that uh, performance by the PV is 30 to 40% in average faster than all these conventional resources and in fact it can be done much faster uh, yeah if you if you remove the internal ramp limits in a, in, in a pv plant controllers and the pv inverters themselves that is actually documented in a report that we published for this 300 megawatt plant demonstration it's available on a uh, on a net for free you guys can easily google it but uh, that report has many answers to this particular question too <clears throat> i hope i answered this yes Yes, you did. Thank you so much. And maybe what we can do later on is take the, uh, you know, link of the report and circulate it as a part of a proceeding, which would be really Definitely. useful to the participants. Yeah. Uh, one more, Jan, one more question I'll pose and then we'll wrap it up as I see that we are a little, we are going over the time and it's a, a broader question. Um, and I think Satish has attempted answering it, but still I would uh, pose it to you. Uh, so the question is, um, in the US, what are the various mechanisms using which ISO is managing the system demand variability vis-a-vis -vis maintaining grid stability? I'm sorry, I, I could not. Okay. Let me, yeah. Uh, okay, let me say it one more time. Um, in the US, what are the various mechanisms used by the ISOs for managing the demand variability? Visible maintaining the grid stability. 
Well, uh, yeah, I'm not a really market person um, to answer that, but this is normally and uh, this is normally handled by uh, the market mechanisms. Uh, um, so the both day ahead and the real time uh, dispatch, you know, in, in a system is happening based on a uh, both load forecast and the resource forecast. So um, the conventional units are, are dispatched based on uh, uh, on this forecast and also the uh, um, security constraint um, uh, unit unit commitment mechanisms. Um, so there is a whole market system in place where the uh, participating units, you know, they provide their bids, you know, in, in both day ahead and uh, uh, in the real time markets and are awarded the service. Um, so, so that's kind of in general how, how this handled. I mean, the, the variability is not handled in any specific way um, different than, for example, the load variability is handled. Of course, it, 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 it makes it more demanding because net system variability is higher, but it's all it's all handled by the existing uh, the market mechanisms and also the uh, reserve allocations for um, reliability services. Um, I know this is a very general question. Uh, we can provide more detailed response on that. Uh, uh, David Palchak is on the phone too. Uh, is on in a call too, so we can we can later provide more detailed response to this. Exactly. So that is maybe what we can do is collate this information and pass it on. Unless David, you would like to yeah. chime in now. I think Bahan um, provided the overview of really what happens. It's mostly markets, um, if not markets. You know, sometimes it's it's more vertically integrated in the U.S. And um, but most of the systems work more or less like a market, even if they are more vertically integrated here now. So, yeah, happy to provide more information later. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, thanks so much, David and Bahan. I think we'll wrap it up. We are already over the time, uh, but. Bahan, thank you for a great presentation. I already see a lot of comments on the uh, in a chat box and as well as question in, in the Q&A box asking for more references and more information uh, on the case studies of uh, wind and solar PV microgrid and we'll follow it up with you, collate this information and pass it on to all the participants. Uh, but um, I really wanted to thank you for sparing time uh, very early in the morning for you and for David and Mohit also uh, to join us today. Um, uh, for all the participants, I'm mean, really thankful for you, uh, thankful that you all could join in uh, to hear this very interesting international experience. We hope uh, that, uh, you know, the experiences which we are doing in with the AGC pilot in India uh, with uh, POSOCO would also give out some interesting uh, results which uh, would be worth presenting and that's something which we will be working towards uh, in the next, uh, maybe towards April or so. Um, but um, once again, we thank you so much for joining us. We will be circulating the proceedings of today's webinar along with the presentations and a recording which will be posted on the GTG's RISE website um, to all of you. We'll also, uh, many, some of the questions I see has been answered online by uh, both Satish and Chandra. But there are some which we couldn't uh, we couldn't get to. We hope to you know uh, respond to them as a part of our proceeding. But thank you once again for joining us today, and thank you so much, Pahan and David, for sparing time and sharing this experience. Really interesting and useful for all the participants in India as well as in South Asia. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you and good night to all uh, joining from India, and uh, have a good day to all those people who have uh, joined us from US. Uh, thank you once again. And thank bye you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you, Chandra, Satish, Vahan, David, thank Mohit. And Mr. thanks to uh, yeah, GTG Drive team for organizing. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Kupi, uh, Chandra, uh, Satish, and Rajiv Ji for joining in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. We were nervous initially, but thanks you were able to join in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Should we end? Yeah. I think we should. Ha, I think we should. We can wrap it up now. Sure. Thank you so much, Ripu. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Munali. Bye bye.